Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop. Today we're taking this plow plane that had several broken parts. We're going to be remaking a few parts, cleaning it up, restoring it, and getting this thing working. So let's dive in and have a little fun with a plow plane. So this is a plow plane from a friend of the channel. But unfortunately, one of the beams has broken. And the other one is, well, not as useful as it should be. So we are going to replace the two beams and wedges and clean this up and make a functioning plane. I'm going to start with a piece of Bodark or Osage Orange, or it goes by a lot of different names. It's a really nice hardwood, a little buttery, but very, very tough. It is um, also very dulling on tools. But it is a, a close color match uh, to original beach though um, it will darken slightly differently over time. You can see how the plane is really, really dark. That's just from all of the oils and use over the years um, and a lot of lanolin and other things that were, uh, were mixed in for lubrication and just general use of old wooden planes. So we're going to make this roughly to the same size. It's a long stick that's about three quarter by three quarter and then a bump on the end. It's actually a little bit thinner than three quarter and so I'm starting with a piece that is actually three quarter and then we'll trim that back. So we're going to cut down all of the little notches and we're going to make it a little bit larger than it needs to be because we can always bring it down into shape. The, the long rip down to the middle is one you want to be careful because it's very easy to split off that ledge at the other end. There are these brass ferrules that came out of the old ones. So I need to pound those off and those are going to be um, inset into this. I need to know exactly where they're going to fit. And you'll see that this comes to a problem in the future. So when you get right up close to this ledge, you're going to have to use a file or a float or a chisel and get it up in close. And then the rest of it you can bring in with the spoke shave and then do the final work with the file, which gives you a nice clean edge. So I'm going to mark off the thickness, actually a little bit larger than the thickness of the ferrule because I want the wood to stick out just past the end of it. And then we can mark all the way around the board, and this will be our stop cut that we're going to cut into. Um, but realize before I do this, this is actually a little bit thicker than it needs to be, and I actually can take it over to the plane and slide it into one of the holes and make sure that the width of the board is correct. Once that's in, we can then lay out onto this where the ferrule will be and what we need to remove. We're going to cut down a little bit on the shoulders all the way around, and then we can cut come in with a chisel and pop out all of the excess down to this shoulder cut. And uh, In this case I actually decided to saw down to it because the grain was running a little bit um, screwy on this. So uh, yeah, cut down some of it, split down some of it, and then we need to cut slits in this um, and a hash mark. Uh, later on I decided to not cut the slits until after it was fully shaped, but then once the corners are close we can use a file, a rasp, or in this case a float or a curved tooth float. I'm actually going to widen out the mouth just a little bit. It'll make it easier for the wedges to go in. Then once it's down to the right size, we can pound the ferrule on, and then those extra pieces we cut off with the saw, we can turn those into wedges. We want to make sure that the ferrule is fully seated all the way on the bottom, and then we can drive in the wedges. Um, to split them out, if you can push them against something, um, in the end I, I got a block of wood I can push them against rather than bashing into the aluminum. Um, but then they wedge down in, and you've got a nice tight fit on there, and that wedges into that ferrule amazingly well, it becomes almost impossible to get it off. Yes, that is a little bit of foreshadowing. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the little scraps you cut off with the saw, save those. They make perfect grain match and you get these really nice little wedges that can drive down in there. I've done this quite a few times now because I've had to remake this and uh, each time it gets a little bit easier. But it was somewhere around here I thought, wait a second, this should not be this way. So that is a really nice pretty ferrule fitting on there. I'm really, really happy with that. The only problem is it should be rot rotated 180. So I have a couple options. Number one, I could shorten this down to just make a shorter arm. It would be about three quarter inch shorter than the original. Number two, I could remake a whole arm, but I don't have any more of this. Or number three, I could take the ferrule off maybe and rotate it around and put it on the other way and fill it in. I'm gonna try that first. And if not, then I need to make a whole new arm. Let's give it a try. So in this case, the easy fix or the lazy fix is to try and take it off and flip it around the other way. But then that also means the tenon is not going to be as strong as it should be. And after a bit of this, I realized, no, let's, let's remake it. Yeah, so after playing around with it, I could cut it off and just make the arm a little shorter, which would be okay. Um, but I think I'm going to go and just make a whole new arm. The problem is I don't have any more Bodark, and so I'm going to have to make 
um, a whole new one out of something else. I think I have some hard maple, so we might do it out of that. But um, yeah, so off camera, I'm going to go and remake this up to the same point, and then we'll catch back up. So back to the drawing board we go. I have a piece of hard maple on here, and unfortunately uh, it is it looks horrible on camera because it just whites out and washes out, but it, it cuts really well. Uh, hard maple is a nice wood to work with. It will dull the wood fairly quickly, not as quick as bow um, but it is a nice overall general good hand plane wood, and it will um, create great hand planes, as in it's a hand plane wood for making hand planes, not a great wood for making things with hand planes because it's actually pretty difficult to work with hand tools um, but it makes very very good plain bodies it is a very resilient wood that uh, will last a long time so you can see um, everything we've done before we're going to come back and do it again on this end I decided to do far more chisel work than working with the files but that means a good sharp edge and uh, make sure you blow out the other side and run into other things but it's amazing what you can do with a really nice sharp edge, even in hard maple. For this ledge, I decided to chisel back and create a little ledge here that is at the right length. And then I can come in with a spoke shave and actually cut in uh, where the chisel left off and take it right down to my marking gauge line. That still leaves it a little bit rough as a transition, so you can come in with the file, float, and rasp and clean it up and get a really nice, clean, smooth surface on this one. We want this to be flat and smooth, as that's what the plane will be running on. Then again, we need to bring this down to the exact thickness, a little bit less than three quarter inch. You'll want to fit your plane body and make sure that it's what you're looking for. And then back to the ferrule. Uh, using a fine pencil, we can mark out where it needs to be. And this time I decided to do the rounding on the back surface first, because then that reminds me that the ferrule needs to go on this direction. And because the marks are on there, I'm just going to keep planing down until the pencil marks just disappear. And that's right about where the edge of the ferrule is. I'm going to use a marking gauge to mark in the depth, the, which is a little bit more than the ferrule is long, so there's a little bit of wood sticking out past the end. We want a little bit on there so we can mushroom it out and clean it out. On the back end, this is the side I didn't do before, uh, there actually needs to be a cut slit down so that the ferrule has a place to fit into it because the ferrule isn't the, the, the final thing on the board. There's actually a little piece that wraps around it. Nice little detail uh, from the original. But then we need to cut in the shoulder all the way around, and then we can come in and remove it out. Now this has really nice straight grain, so I was able to uh, chisel it out. There's a little bit of an angle on it, so on one side you have to cut back in a little ways, and on the other side you just have to be a little more careful, but it actually runs really well and I can get that nice clean flat edge. Again, save those pieces. You can use those for the wedges. We can round over the edge with a file and we want to get it to the point where the ferrule just starts to go on. I know that I could pound it down all the way. At that point, we take it off and we can cut in these slits for the wedges, one going in either direction. And then after, after that's done, we can put the ferrule back on. Man, I feel like I've been here before. We can tap this down. You can see the wood sticks out just a little bit past. And I want to make sure it's fully seated. You can use a flat blade screwdriver or something like that just to tap it down all the way on there. Then we can trim up some wedges. Um, you can see I changed over to a block of wood to trim it down into. And this actually works really well because I can bring it down into the wedge shape that I want and then cut it to the exact size and then tap it down in. Here I'm using a chasing hammer, which is a great way to just have a very, very good control so you're not splitting it. And it pounds down nice and flush. Do the other two and then we can smooth it out and file the top end nice and rounded and it gives that nice impression so that you can do your plane adjustment by actually tapping this to move the fence in and out. So it's meant to be hit. Look, <laughs> I feel like we were just here a little bit ago, but uh, this time it's actually correct. I got the rounded side over here. <laughs> Let's keep working. And now we're back to where we were before. So let's go to the other end. And this one has a lot of detail on it, which really isn't necessary, but it looks very, very cool. So there's a chunk that needs to be cut off here and the ferrule actually goes a little bit farther past. But the ferrule is thicker than my saw blade. So I'm actually gonna use a file here that is the same thickness as the ferrule. And I'm gonna use the file basically like a saw to cut down this notch. And that's where the ferrule will slide back into. Then we can chop off the excess on the side back to where we penciled. Remember to save this. You can use those for the wedges. And we want to clean this down. Now I could come into the file and clean it out and rasp it, but I found that this was just kind of fun to create these tiny little curls coming off of here. And uh, it's a, just an enjoyable time to use a good sharp chisel that works well. Then we're going to cut the slits down now that we know that the ferrule will work. And then we can drive the ferrule down on and put the wedges in. And this is starting to sound familiar. I've done this a few times for some reason by now. 
<laughs> yeah, and the, the original one, I made one arm that was perfect and done, and I messed up on the second one. So now this is the fourth of these arms that I have made. Um, so it, 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 you, you get a little bit better the more times you do it. <laughs> We're going to round off the edge and just give a nice clean transition to the brass ferrule. And then at this point, we can round the back of this. I'm going to be putting it in and out of the plane body. I want to make sure that it, that it slides down in nicely. I want it to have a nice tight fit into the body. It should move with a little bit of tapping back and forth, but it shouldn't slide in and out um, of its own force. So we've got a nice smooth transition all the way around this rod so it slides into the, the body. And it's amazing what you can do with files and sneak right up on it. You can see it slides in nicely up to that point, but I just need to do a little bit more work. I have a bow saw that comes in and does the final little detail. If you want to see that, I have several videos on making the bow saw. Now, there is a nut that needs to go in the back of this with a diamond shape, and this is what actually will hold the fence onto these arms. And this little diamond-shaped nut then gets recessed in here, so I can lay it out and mark it with the chisel, get it exactly where it needs to be, and then come in and carve this out. I'm going to take it just a little bit deeper with the chisel, and then come in and pair it back. And it's really fun to just bust out these little pieces. It took uh, two passes to get down to the right depth. You want to pound it down so that it's sticking just a little below the wood so that you can come back and file the wood to give you a nice smooth transition. Back to the other end again, we're going to do a little bit of carving on this to make an ornate end on this. The original one has this uh, weird uh, fluting and, uh, well, it's just an interesting shape that isn't really necessary, but it looks good. And so it's a good chance to try something new. So I found a carving chisel with the right radius and just started going to town on it. And uh, this is a, a fun time to experiment, try something new. And if it doesn't work off, well, then that's fine. Um, it's not, not necessary. There's no function to it. It just looks good. There's a, a top bead that I can come in and I want to chase it a little bit deeper so I can put the skew in there and shed the fibers. And then there's an OG, which is a concave matched with a convex. And so there's kind of an S shape when you're looking at it. So I'm making the concave and then I flip the chisel over and make the convex on the bottom. And it's just a nice little design. I saw that I didn't take it down quite as far as I wanted to, um, so I had to do a little bit more on it, but it matches the original relatively well. I'm not perfect, but it is, it's a nice, fun little thing to experiment yeah. with. Now we need to make a couple wedges because the original wedges were missing, and I thought with a little bit of contrast on this, let's try something a little wild. Uh, so I had some paduk that was a little over a quarter inch thick. Um, it needed to be taken down to a little under a quarter inch thick. So I made a strip that is one inch by whatever the original thickness was. And then I can clean up the saw marks and give myself a nice um, clean edge. It really only needs to be about three quarter inch thick, but I want a little more mass on there because I'm going to get two wedges out of this one stick. Once we have the stick where we want it to be, then we can plane it down to give ourselves the exact thickness. We can slide it in and then mark where the entrance and exit of it are. So we're just going to put these two marks on the stick, and then we can play connect the dots between those two marks to create our wedge. This wedge will give us the exact angle, and oh, lo and behold, because we cut it corner to corner, we now have two wedges. They're longer than they need to be because I made them at one inch as opposed to the three quarter. So I can drive those in and then mark how long I want them to be, cut the tip off, cut the back off, and make them precisely the length that they need to be. We're also going to round them over and smooth them off uh, so we get a nice clean look on them. Uh, just quickly flipping a, a, a plane over and hitting them on the edge or just a little file work. And it's nice to just create a little detail right on the corner. Or, yeah, you can bring in the chisel and have a little bit of fun scraping and cleaning. And this is, anytime you do a little chisel work, it's a lot of fun. Now, the body itself needs a good bit of work. Everything on there is generally functional, but if I can clean it up a little bit, it will work even better. So we're going to take the whole thing apart. Uh, the brass, I'm not going to really hit that much. Um, I just want to clean any of the junk off it. There were a lot of edges that weren't flush and flat, uh, particularly on the top edge. There had been a split that had been repaired. So I had to take a plane to that one to take it down smooth. Most of the sides, it was just cleaning the junk off with a card scraper. And I'm not making it perfect. I want to show some of the original patina on there, but getting rid of any Thing that's going to get in the way. For the brass, I'm going to be hitting it with a little bit of 400 grit sandpaper, again, leaving a little bit of that patina on there. I'm not going to buff it up and make it shiny. Uh, I just want to make it uh, look a little bit old, used, and worn, but still have that brass look to it so it's not just black on there. And It's the, 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 the look I, I like on it. Then everything gets boiled linseed oil and paste wax. Um, this is one of the best things you can do for old hand tools, old wooden tools, is let them soak up as much boiled linseed oil as they want. And we're going to soak it up and let it sit and soak up more and let it sit. And especially some of these old pieces like this, you can actually just watch it soak in. 
Uh, it was probably uh, two or three soakings to let it take up as much as it wanted. Then after that, we can clean off all the excess oil, apply paste wax, and then it's time to start putting this together. And we can slide everything back into place and we can put the fence on. The bolts on this were a little rusted, um, but I didn't have anything that would work quite right in stock. Uh, it's something I, I could order online, but uh, we, we, you work with what you got. We can put it all back in place, get ready to put the iron in, and then realize, oh, yeah, the iron needs a little bit of work. Oh, yeah, and all the screws, make sure you clock them so that they're all in line. It just looks so much nicer. So for the iron, it really didn't need that much. Uh, it was at a bit of an angle, so I had to sharpen it up, drive it in, and set it up. These are really nice because you can have different size irons, and most of the time you'll find them with a quarter inch because that's what was used more than anything else. And then once it's in place, let's take her for a test drive. And oh, look, we've got a groove, uh, a plow plane. Uh, these are really kind of fun, especially these old ones. You can get them relatively affordably, and they will do all of your plow work. So you can make grooves and, uh, and just about any board and any width, and you can get them with replacement irons at whatever width you want, and they're a lot of fun. Most of the time, they're going to need a little bit of work to get them up and going in, but once you do, you have a useful tool that has been around for 100 years or more, and it will last another 100 years or more if you take care of it. Yeah, um, find one, repair it, and they're a lot of fun. Hee, pretty. So there you have it. I really like how this came out. Now, originally, I was trying to make them out of the Bodark or the, uh, the Osage Orange. Um, I really liked that look. I thought it would be a good contrast, but the piece I had, well, you, you saw I messed it up. Um, so I went on to the next best thing, which is hard maple. Uh, now, I know there's a huge contrast difference uh, because this is actually beech, um, but I didn't have any beech in stock, and hard maple is actually pretty close to it. And I thought since we have such a contrast in there, we'd go ahead and throw in some paduke for the wedges and really kind of make this thing a little bit different. I like it cleaning them up just to the point where you can still see some of the old patina, but the brass shines through so you can still see its brass. I, I, I like the look of this. I know everyone has a different amount that they like to restore to. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things that makes it fun because there is no right or wrong. You can do whatever you want. I have several old videos restoring other plow planes and many, many other tools that are restored. Um, so this is one that I, I really like. And these simple ones with the wedge design, they just work really, really well. If you want to see a lot more detail about uh, wooden plow planes, I'd say actually go over to Rex Kruger's channel. He has a, a really good in-depth about plow planes and old combination planes. So I'll try and leave a link to that one down below as well. So this one actually isn't mine. I'm restoring it for a friend of the channel and I uh, hope he likes it. So uh, yeah, I'll be getting this in the mail to you here soon. If you do have any questions, thoughts, ideas, throw those in the comments down below. That really does help out the channel. So thank you for that. That means a lot. Anytime you hit like, comment, share, subscribe, that helps get us in front of more people and helps the channel grow. Thank you. And if you want to take it one step farther, we have patrons on Patreon. Everyone scrolling over to the side, they are the ones who are financially helping us and keeping this channel going actually. They're the ones that keep the lights on, that allow me to buy everything we need. We are completely sponsored by you, the viewer, so thank you for that. If you'd like to find out more, you can look in Patreon. There's links to that down below. Or click the little join button and become a member here on YouTube. We do have special perks for both, and that really helps us out. So that being said, I think they'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. A plow plane. That's like a an airborne earth mover. Mm -hmm.